I'd like to welcome our guest, Dr. Wood, and, and, and we're always pleased to have these, these programs. When I saw the, the title of today's lecture, it, it, it brought to mind, we had a, a book discussion one time with some inmates, and, and it was gonna be on um, the, an ancient Greek philosopher, Aristotle. He, he wrote a whole book on ethics, and part of that is, is on happiness. So this, I had never done this before, and I sat down with them, and I said, okay, let's start off with a simple question. What makes people happy? And they didn't say anything for a few seconds, and so I s repeated the question, what makes people happy? And finally, one of the guys spoke up, and he said, well, it makes my grandma happy to sit out on the porch and get drunk and yell at people. <laughs> uh, that's not, that wasn't exactly the answer I was looking for. But here at the library, we try to set our standards a little higher than that. We've got some programs. If you don't have anything better to do than sit on your porch and yell at people, um, this Sunday we have a, a guitar concert. We'll be here in this auditorium. Gail Salal from uh, France will be playing. That's this Sunday from 2.30 to 4.30. And, um, of course, this month is, is African American History Month. And we've got some program guides if uh, you want to stop and pick one of those up. This, these are programs that are going all across Davidson County at all the libraries. So it's got everything that's going on this whole month of February in those. And then, um, in case you have not heard, in March the 2nd, that's also a Saturday. Um, that's a Saturday. <coughs> Jan Martel, Nashville Reads, uh, the, the book this time is going to be Life of Pi by Jan Martel. So he will be here on March the 2nd. Um, there will be an uh, author talk at 3 o'clock, and then there will be, be a book signing at 4 o'clock. So we hope you can join us for that. Most of those, as, if you've done these before, there will be tickets available. Uh, for the latest information, just look on our website. So now, without further ado, I'll turn the program over to Dr. Wood and... and uh, Let's get on with hearing what our guest has to say. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ron, for, Ron, for uh, bringing us up to date on the uh, library's activities. Uh, if you want to know more about this series, uh, you should take home a nice color, color printed uh, poster which has all four of our talks this uh, spring, uh, and something about the people doing the talking. Um, today, uh, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Scott Aiken, who's going to talk to us today um, about ancient paradoxes in the ethical life. Uh, Scott teaches logic and ethics and ancient philosophy um, uh, in the philosophy department here at Vanderbilt. And he has a special interest in theories of argumentation, especially from a pragmatist perspective. Uh, Scott is an award-winning and inspiring teacher, and he's the author and editor of five books with more on the way. The two titles I like best are Reasonable Atheism. Um, it sounds as if it's being contrasted with the unreasonable kind of atheism. Um, yes, and another book, uh, Pragmatism, A Guide for the Perplexed. Now, you may recall that my original inspiration for this whole Thinking Out of the Lunchbox series was the way Socrates used to hang out in the Agora, the marketplace in his native Athens. He would go down there and harangue people, getting them to question what they thought they knew declaring that his distinction was to know that he didn't know anything. Scott draws substantively from the Greeks in his thinking, with a particular interest in the Stoics, and especially uh, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. We are more accustomed to connect, connect the Greeks with logical paradoxes and paradoxes of motion as when Zeno would argue that you couldn't get to the public library for this talk because you'd first have to come halfway to the public library. 
And before you got halfway, you'd have to get a quarter of the way, and so on and so on. In fact, you'd never get out of bed. Today, Scott will talk especially about ethical paradoxes and how they're still significant for thinking about our lives. Scott. All right. <clears throat> I'm a walker and talker, so lucky for me, I've got the wireless. I'm also a PowerPointer, so I'm going to click through. Um, first, uh, thank you uh, to David uh, for the generous introduction. Uh, I will briefly return the favor. Um, I did my graduate work at Vanderbilt, and um, I showed up in the mid in the mid '90s, and I thought I was I thought myself uh, quite the quite the hotshot. And um, David's class was my first uh, graduate seminar. It was my first introduction to graduate level philosophy. And um, I learned something uh, from David. Uh, now, David is not just uh, a, a first class uh, scholar. He's also a teacher with the patience of Job. And so a few things have changed and a few things have stayed the same. David is still uh, uh, a kind and considerate colleague. Uh, and hopefully I've grown up a little bit. We'll see. Uh, secondly, I want to thank uh, the Friends of the Public Library uh, for, this, for this series and supporting this series. This really enriches us. This is a great library. Have you guys seen the bumper stickers? Uh, uh, every great city has a great library. Nashville's well-placed to be a great city, uh, really with the help of the, the Friends of the Library. This is a great library. Uh, from the impressive architecture, we had, a we had a colleague named Henry Tilo who was a classicist who said that the architecture of this library is a lesson in civics, right? It makes people talk to each other, right? It makes people thoughtful. And that's a great thing. And the, and the, the, the public offerings for this library are great. Uh, when my kids were small, we were regulars here on Wednesdays also, but not for the Outside the Lunchbox series. They didn't sit still for these sorts of things. We were here for the, uh, the story hour. So uh, are you familiar with the, with, the great, with, with, the, with the great stars of the story hour, Mary Mary, uh, the professor, Library Pete? Uh, they enriched our lives too. And so the library enriches us from the, from, from the very beginning of our lives all the way until we're adults. This is a great library, and uh, we're really thankful for, the, for, this, for this institution. It really does enrich Nashville. Okay, so today I'm here to talk about ancient paradoxes and the good life, the ethical life. Now, the paradoxical tradition in ethics begins before Socrates, but it's really perfected with Socrates. So we'll take a look at the paradoxical tradition. We've got its most famous and most prominent member, Socrates. And the Stoics in Imperial Rome saw themselves as extending it. We see this with the philosopher emperor, Marcus Aurelius, and the philosopher slave, Epictetus. They were both Stoics, but Stoicism between those two was supposed to show that this philosophical view was one that could be instantiated and held by anyone in any station. It's not a philosophy of winners, and it's not the philosophy of losers. It's the philosophy that anyone can have and live well. But this ancient philosophical tradition of, of paradoxes was before Socrates. We see it in num a number of the Greek sages, like Xenophanes and Heraclitus, and even before them, with mythical figures like Odysseus and Heracles. And we see it extend well beyond the ancient period, too. We see it in the Christian monastic tradition. We see it in the Enlightenment and in the Renaissance, in figures like Descartes, and in figures like Kant, and in figures like Machiavelli. This is a tradition that's about seeing certain tensions in the way in which we think about ethics and holding our feet to the fire with regards to the principles that we think are right. Now, the first step here is for me to just lay out what I'm out to do. So I'm out to do three things in this talk. First, I want to just lay out what two of the core paradoxes of this paradoxical tradition. So I'm going to sort of, and whenever you hear these paradoxes, I'm going to kind of work our way into seeing that these are things that, despite the fact that they are paradoxical, they are things that we naturally and are already kind of familiar with. The second line is that, look, if it's ethics, it's not just about articulating the principles, it's about living in accord with them, right? If it's about ethics and the good life, we want just not to have the principles in our back pocket, we want those principles to inform our lives and to have 
a practical payoff for those principles. And so the Stoics were really interested in working out exercises to live in light of these principles. So then I'll so get, articulate some paradoxes, some principles to live in light of these paradoxes, and then finally I'll close with what I think is one of the most devastating objections to this tradition and the attempt at an answer, okay? So some paradoxes, uh, some ways to live in light of them. Once we see how to live in light of them, we see a problem, and I think that I can answer it. Okay. So first, this paradoxical tradition is posited on a number of familiar thoughts and ones that really we've pretty much all either thought or had somebody say to us uh, that these are familiar kinds of uh, ethical principles that we, that we often find ourselves agreeing with. So for example, we have the, it's not whether or not you lose, it's how you play the game, right? Now that doesn't sound paradoxical, but we'll talk about paradoxes in just a second. But that's a, that's a familiar thought, right? We have other thoughts like you can't take it with you, right? That, that external things don't matter that much, that these are things that you, don't, that you shouldn't ruin your life on the basis of, taking, of acquiring those things. Um, it's not getting what you want, it's wanting what you get. That being satisfied and being able to recognize that reality can't, isn't, is not always in abundance for you, right? And being capable of being satisfied. That's what Thanksgiving is, right? Thanksgiving is being happy with the things that have been given to you. Uh, and, and, uh, and in fact, uh, the, the, this last one, it's not getting what you want, it's wanting what you get. That even shows up in pop songs now. Uh, there was a, there's a, a, Sheryl Crow has a song titled that. And so this thought is a familiar thought. It's one that we can sort of think our way into pretty easily. Um, being good is its own reward is a kind of one of these thoughts that, again, animates this tradition. And there's a corollary, too, that being bad is a kind of a punishment in and of itself. Being that kind of person is something that it looks like it's a kind of a punishment also. Um, we also see this tradition in Reinhold Niebuhr's uh, serenity prayer. Uh, so you have the distinction between the things that you can't change and the things that you can and you hope that you can have the serenity, serenity to accept the things that you can't change, the courage to change the things that you can, and the wisdom to be able to know which one to do, right? To know the difference, right? So these are all thoughts that are familiar to us, that we can live in light of. Okay, so these are thoughts. Now, let's get clear about paradoxes. Paradox is a very specific kind of word in the ancient tradition. <coughs> it's an ancient Greek word that's composed of really two roots, para and doxa. Para just means beside or alongside or against. Doxa means belief or opinion. And so a paradox is something that's a surprising thing, a counterintuitive thing, a demanding thing that somebody would say, of you, say to you. And so as a consequence, ancient paradoxes were demanding ethical principles that looked like it required that you have to change something substantial about the way that you live. That's what an ethical paradox was in the ancient tradition. Now notice, by the way, that we can kind of feel the paradoxicality of those earlier thoughts that we had before, right? It's not whether or not you win or lose, it's how you play the game. But who goes to the Hall of Fame? Who, get, who gets to go to Disneyland at the end of the big game? The winners, the, win, the winners, right? Do, do, do they have a good sport uh, wing of the Hall of Fame, right? Do they have the graceful loser part? where it's like, didn't cry after getting blown out? <laughs> like, do you, get a do you get a ribbon for that? No, we cheer for the winners. Those are the, one those are the ones that we like the most, but yet we think, eh, but it's not the way you love you, way how you play the game. No, we're paradoxical. We live, we live the paradox, right? We've got it inside of us. We think that those things are right. We think that, boy, it would be really great if I could live in accord with that, but do we? No. No. Oh. The ancient paradoxical tradition is holding our feet to the fire with regards to those principles that we think are right, and then we say, meh, but I like winners. No. Fix yourself. Live differently. Value differently. That's the ancient paradoxical tradition. See yourself from the perspective of those principles and do your best to live in accord with them. That's an ancient paradox in ethics. Okay? So, the first paradox we see with Socrates. This is a picture. Uh, this is this is like the uh, uh, the the artist's rendering from the trials, right? You know those. So they didn't get to take photographs then. You're not allowed to take photographs during trials, right? That's a joke. Okay, fine. So <laughs> they don't get better. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so here's Socrates, and Socrates was uh, had been 
uh, accused and convicted of impiety and corrupting the young, right? And the vote to convict him of impiety was, I'm forgetting the number, so I wrote him on my hand, just a second. The vote was 280 to 220 to convict him. So he lost. But then when they, but then when it came to the punishment round, they voted for death, and the number was 360 to 140 for death. That means more people voted to kill him than voted, than thought that he, more, more people voted for death for the, as the punishment than thought he was guilty. <laughs> that's a very strange jury. Now, that seems totally unjust. It doesn't just seem like it, so one thought is that he, ha, that he was unjustly prosecuted and it sounds like he had a perfectly fine defense but he, still got, but he still, got, still got convicted. And then even after he gets convicted, people who thought that he was innocent voted that he should die. That just sounds, screw, that just sounds screwy, that doesn't sound right. And so Socrates has every right to think that he was being treated unjustly, that he was being harmed. That, he, that something wrong had happened and that he was on the receiving end of something very bad. But at the end of the trial, after he's received the conviction and after it's clear that something unjust has happened, Socrates delivers this line to the jury. I do not believe that a good man can be harmed in life or death. You can't harm me. You can kill me, and you can unjustly convict me, but you cannot harm me. And so this is the first paradox of this tradition, sometimes called the paradox of invulnerability, that insofar as you are virtuous, you cannot be harmed. Thinking your way into this one requires a little bit of work. So here's Socrates' reasoning, and he gets it out in a follow-up dialogue, where, look at this picture. Everyone around him is lamenting and crying. But what is Socrates doing? Teaching, thinking, work, continuing to work on his virtue. A death sentence can harm you only if it makes you cheat, lie, and grovel to avoid it. Poverty can harm you only if it makes you mean and selfish. Illness can harm you only if it makes you empty and resentful. Those aren't harms. Those are inconveniences. Those are conditions for you to be virtuous. Insofar as you're virtuous, you cannot be truly harmed. And so as a consequence, we see here, everyone else has kind of got the wrong conception as to what, what, what real harm is. They think that something really bad has happened. Socrates, very famously, uh, before he dies, he says, offer a cock to Asclepius. That means that he thinks that he's gotten over the life where he could suffer these kinds of slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and be a spirit. Now, whether or not he's right about that part, we're not entirely sure. But one thing's for sure is that he thinks that he cannot be truly harmed by this. Now, think your way, think your way into this. Think of the ways in which we can discover that thinking that our end is acquiring things, or thinking that our objective is social status, or thinking that uh, the collection, uh, that the accumulation of money is our objective. These are externals, but think of the way that the pursuit of those things can distort us. Being top dog, having the biggest bank account. Think of the way that those pursuits can distort us. It's recognizing that that we then are able to answer a follow-up question. What is virtue if it can make us invulnerable? If you're invulnerable only insofar as you can have virtue, how does virtue make you invulnerable? And the answer is being able to tell the difference between the things that are worth pursuing and the things that aren't. Knowledge. Knowledge is at the core of virtue. Knowledge of what matters and what doesn't. And so, the second paradox is called the paradox of cognitivity. Cogni cognition just means knowledge or the ability to think, think, think about things. The paradox of cognitivity is that knowledge is, I'm sorry, virtue is knowledge. Virtue is knowledge, what matters and what doesn't. Once you have that knowledge, you live in accord with it. And so, seeing things aright 
the objective of this paradoxical tradition is what you might say, the objective of achieving moral knowledge and that moral knowledge directing your life so that you don't twist yourself up about things that don't matter, that you don't make exceptions for yourself in cases of virtue or injustice. Living in accord with the principles that you think are right. Now, the Stoics thought that Socrates was dead on about these things. And so the philosopher slave, Epictetus, Epictetus, by the way, was born in Lydia in Asia Minor, a slave. Most likely, his job when he was small was breaking rocks to be able to use for the Romans to build their roads. But he was bought by one of Nero's, uh, uh, Emperor Nero's um, secretaries who saw something in him, we don't know what. And he educated Epictetus to be his assistant. And one of the things about being a, a, a secretary of the emperor is that you need to know some philosophy to be able to keep track of all the details of state. And so Epictetus, a slave, was sent to school to learn philosophy, to be, he, uh, to be a better secretary. But Epictetus, whenever he saw the paradox of cognitivity, said, we need really three areas of development to be able to get it right. First, we need the perfection of our judgment. We need to be good critical thinkers. We need, and so stoic logic, is the development of our capacity for being good critical thinkers. Being able to ask why. Being able to distinguish a good reason from a bad reason. The development of critical thinking. Next, being able to perfect your motives. Being only motivated by what your duty is. Being able to recognize what your duty is and being motivated only by justice. Not by selfishness, not by petty squabbles, not by wanting to get the better of somebody. Be motivated only by justice. Finally, and most famously, the perfection of our emotions. Trying to find a way in the midst of the grist mill that is this world. You get treated badly by people. People say bad things about you. You don't get your fair share. What happens? If you see things from the right perspective, if you see things from the perspective of what matters, you can maintain calm. You, can, you aren't harmed. So that's the first part, the two stoic paradoxes, the two parado paradoxes of this ethical tradition, and three ways that you develop it. Now some practices to be able to get good at these three features, judgment, motives, and emotions. How to perfect your judgment, how to see things clearly, two answers. Socrates' answer was developed with the Socratic method. The problem that, it se that, that, that seems to be the case is that so many of us don't have the right conception of what justice is. So many of us think that courage is something else. That we have the wrong idea of what courage is. That we have the wrong idea of what being pious is. And so one of the ways in which we get ethical disagreement and ethic that we get messed up so bad ethically is just that we have the wrong kinds, the wrong kinds or we're not entirely clear what our concepts are. It's best to get clear about what our concepts are. So every Socratic dialogue, every time Socrates ever talked to somebody, they employ a concept like virtue or courage or justice, and Socrates says, what's that? Tell me what virtue is. Tell me what justice is. If justice is what's motivating you, tell me what justice is. So Socrates' method is out to clarify our concepts. The philosopher emperor, Marcus Aurelius, thought that it's not the top part that requires clarification, it's the bottom part, the things about which we reason. If we can see the externals that we squabble over, if we can see the things that make us so that we're willing to cheat or lie to get in the right kind of perspective, then we wouldn't be tempted to go against justice to get them. And so Marcus has got what he call, what's sometimes called the exercise of the dinner table. These are stoic exercises now. The exercise of the dinner table is as follows. So Marcus says, okay, you sit down at the dinner table. You're thinking about things that you want. Seeing roasted meats and delicacies on the table, realize that's a dead fish. That's a dead pig body, pig's body. Are you willing to, are you willing to fight, fight, for your, fight with your sister or your brother to get the leg now of the dead body? Right? You know the, the, the Thanksgiving feast fights? I want the leg. You're fighting over a dead bird's leg. Willing to fight anymore? Willing to poke your brother in the eye for that now? No. The fancy wine? Rotten grape juice. That's all that is. 
the elegant purple robes, fancy clothes, sheep's wool dyed with shellfish blood, the purple robes. Making love, are you willing to cheat someone for that? Well, some friction and then a mess. Now, the funny thing is, is that whenever I do this with my, when I did this this last semester with my, inter with my ancient philosophy class, one of my students raised his hand and said, I think he's doing it wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. <laughs> to perfect your motives. So that's perfecting judgment. Perfecting your motives. Acting only on the basis of justice requires, and again, notice what, notice what that last exercise did. It pulls you out of your petty squabbles. It asks you to see yourself from a kind of a third person perspective, a kind of bird's eye view. See yourself not from your own perspective. I lost out. I want the turkey leg. I want more money. I want the fancy clothes. See yourself from the perspective of somebody who hears somebody saying those things. Don't see yourself from your own perspective. See yourself from the perspective of somebody hearing somebody saying those things. <coughs> And so to perfect your motive, it requires that kind of pull up and see yourself from a third person perspective. So whenever you're in the midst of a petty squabble, Marcus asks, see yourself from this perspective. See you both from this perspective and recognize something. That to feel affection for those who err, for those who are in, in disagreement with, is good for you. You can do it if you recognize they're human too. They make mistakes. They're ignorant. They're just doing their best like you. And anyhow, you'll both soon be dead. In the grand scheme of things, we're just a blip. They can't hurt you anyhow. If you're just, if you're virtuous, they can't really harm you. You end up on the wrong end of it, no big deal. And so as a consequence, what should you do? Always treat them decently. Always treat others decently. The perfection of motive is to always find ways to respect the dignity of those who, with whom we disagree. Now finally, now notice how this works, that now we're pulling back and we're finding ways to find peace. And so now the perfection of emotion. Epictetus, the philosopher slave, proposes what's sometimes called the, the teacup exercise. This is again seeing yourself from the third person perspective. So when your neighbor's teacup gets busted, what do you say? Eh, that happens, right? Those things happen, right? Teacups get busted, right? You're perfectly happy saying that with other people's teacups, right? What happens when it's your teacup? <laughs> well, we get upset. But what the crucial thing is being able to take that perspective. When your own cup is broken, he says, take the perspective that you take with others. Take the be capable of taking this perspective of the third person perspective, hearing somebody throwing a fit about the busted teacup. But now Epictetus brings it home. This is sometimes called the, the exercise of the jugs. Again, perfecting your emotions. With the exercise of the jugs, Epictetus says, with anything, with anything, with anything that you feel connection to, that you think is valuable to you, perform the following exercise. So he says, look, imagine that you do it with a jug. Say, so if you're fond of a jug, say, I am fond of a jug, right? Doesn't that sound silly in your ears, right? You say that, you say, I am fond of a jug. And what happens? a little bit of a release, a little bit of distance, so that whenever it's broken, you're not gonna, it's not going to upset you. It's not going to destroy you. It's not something that you're gonna throw a big fit about. But then, he says, you need to build to bigger things, right? Fighting over jugs is one thing, but now we need to build to bigger things. When you kiss your child or wife, say you are kissing a mortal human being. so that when it dies, you will not be upset. Things got different, didn't it? It's here. It's here whenever this attitude about clothes and about money and about all those other possessions get turned on each other. How alien how almost inhuman the Stoics sound now. They sounded so reasonable before, but now they sound alien to us. It seems like in the pursuit 
of invulnerability. The Stoic has made himself inured to the things that are good too. How can you make it such that you can't be moved this way? And so this is sometimes called the damage problem. The damage problem for Stoicism is that in the pursuit of being invulnerable, you make it so that you're not connected enough with the things that actually make your life worthwhile. In trying to be invulnerable, you make yourself inhuman. Seneca, another Roman Stoic, tells the story of Stilbo of Megara. Demetrius of Paros, from Illyria, just across the Adriatic Sea from, um, from uh, Italy, and from Rome, was rampaging across Greece. And in fact, he was considered to be the most dangerous man in the ancient world at the time. The Romans even paused in the Second Punic War to handle Demetrius. They were more afraid of Demetrius than they were of Hannibal. That's what a bad guy he was. He was going through Greece and he came to Megara and he raised the city. Houses burned down, women and children in them. And Stilbo of Megara lost his house and his family. And Stilbo was a Stoic. And so, as the refugees were leaving the city, Demetrius sat on a hill and he watched them leaving, lamenting and crying. And then he sees Stilbo walking, in our words, stoically, out, not weeping, not crying. And Demetrius gets off his horse and comes up to Stilbo and says, I killed your family. I destroyed your town. There's no house. There's no anything for you anymore. And Stilbo replies to Demetrius, I lost nothing of mine today. Now, when Seneca reports this story, he talks as though Stilbo has made it so that Demetrius, the great warlord, can't win a victory. Stilbo is invulnerable. Stilbo cannot be beaten. Stilbo cannot be coerced. Stilbo is autonomous. Stilbo is a hero. But again, in our ears, Stilbo sounds like a villain. How could, how could you think that far? How can you think your way there? So that's the damage problem. And the question is, at what price can the Stoic achieve this invulnerability? It sounds like Stoicism in the pursuit of your own internal light managing that spark of the divine inside of you, keeping virtue alive in you, you lose another kind of virtue. The virtues that you might say are, that we find in connection. But now, the Stoic reply. The Stoic reply is that, remember, Stilbo of Megara was married, he had children and a wife. In the Epictetus exercise, the Stoic presumably gets attached to a jug. He likes his jugs, right? The Stoic is allowed to like his teacups. The Stoic is allowed to have a wife and to, and to kiss her and to bounce a child on his knee. It, that the Stoic lives like anybody else does. The Stoic has the life that everybody else does. It's not that the Stoic climbs up inside of himself and it sort of treats the rest of life with a, with a kind of a scorched earth policy where he raises everything else around him and climbs up into a little inner citadel. The Stoic lives. The Stoic lives with everybody else. But the Stoic does something different inside. The Stoic recognizes that the moments that we have together nevertheless pass. This is just a moment, says the Stoic. It will pass, with the good and the bad. We recognize that, not, that, we're, that we ourselves are finite. You ever hear those love songs, this love will last forever, right? 
the love that will never die, that's nonsense. We die. That's bloated nonsense. We die. Nothing's forever. Don't talk like that. That's silly. We're finite. The stoic, as a consequence, is not caught up with the nonsense that happens whenever we think about the things that we love. The stoic loves with eyes open. It's not that the stoic doesn't love. It's that the stoic loves with eyes open and recognizes the co what the things are that the stoic becomes attached to. So to close, I'm going to tell a story. And uh, I've been telling stories about Stilbo and Epictetus, but this is a story about me. This is my copy of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. And inside it, I keep the following. This is a card from my daughter that she made in second grade. It was for a uh, Father's Day exercise. Really cool. And that's a picture of me. I'm wearing a hat. She didn't know how to bald, draw a bald head. <laughs> it's just an arc. <laughs> uh, that's okay. And that's her. She didn't brush her hair that day either. Uh, but that's nice, but what was inside the card is the best part. It was an exercise, how well do you know your dad? What's his favorite color? He likes green. She was right. What's his favorite food? Probably his steak. She's right. I make an excellent steak. My wife is in the back here. Yes? yes. <laughs> What's his favorite restaurant? He doesn't like to eat out. Yes. Have I told you about my steak? What's his favorite thing to do? He loves to goof around. If he could go anywhere in the world, would it be? He would go to Greece. Yes and yes. I like goofing around. Last question. What's his favorite book? Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. <laughs> you can see why I keep it in the book. But when she gave it to me, <coughs> I picked her up and I kissed her on her head. Can we think that thought? Can we think the thought from Epictetus' exercise of the jugs? Can we think that thought? I'm going to report to you that the thought's not ruinous. What we recognize is that we have moments together. And because of our finitude, because we recognize that we're not together forever. That recognition doesn't rob those moments of, me of meaning. They add to their poignancy. Thank you. that to go on and uh, didn't want it to come to an end <laughs> um, but everything has to come to an end um, so um, yeah I was interested in that point I think it must have been when you were representing Marcus Aurelius's um, um, argument that Because because we are we are finite, we should not um, become too attached to finite things. Um, and uh, I'm wondering whether the the standpoint of eternity, which he seems to be taking up here, is really um, a sort of cheat. I mean, I'm wondering whether this is part of your thought here that. Uh, 
we, 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 we can take up this standpoint of eternity, like, you know, we're all going to die eventually. And, and so in that sense, you might think, well, nothing really matters, because eventually it, you know, it's all going to be gone. But you could say, well, that's ridiculous. Why privilege the eventually? I mean, why not privilege the now? I mean, why take up this standpoint in which, you know, everything has passed? I mean, you could understand why you might do that as a sort of um, a way of trying to avoid pain. But it also, as I think Scott is saying, you also, you seem to be avoiding pleasure too. You seem to be avoiding the, the intensity of your current experience. So your last example is an, an attempt to sort of say, like being finite means actually being here and now with this person in this situation. Um, and I guess my question is, can you, is this an advanced form of stoicism? I mean, is this sort of stoicism 2.0? Uh, <laughs> so that you could like sort of analogy. have your cake and eat it. I mean, I'm wondering whether you're saying you can actually radically affirm the finitude of life and your existence and your relationships and in some sense, not just accept, but as Nietzsche would say, affirm the transience of these things. Yeah. Well, I like the Nietzsche reference too. I mean, Nietzsche was really taken with Amor Fati, uh, Amor Fati uh, that love of fate or being able to endorse and even say, thus I willed it with regards to all, all three things in your life. But you're right, David. Um, Stoicism and in some ways this, Socra this, this feature of Socratic thought is a kind of don't sweat the small stuff philosophy from the perspective where it all looks very small. Right from this perspective of eternity, and Marcus does this all. Marcus does this regularly in the Meditations, where he says, "Think about all of the other kingdoms and empires that came before us. They're dead now. You know, nobody even remembers their names. No one's going to remember your name." Now he's wrong about that. We at least remember it now. But in some ways, that was a kind of a deflate. Uh, these are all deflating kinds of thoughts, and they're. You might even say like they're rationalizing coping mechanisms right. in the face of adversity. Um, and folks will do that, and you'd say like, well, they're really effective whenever you deploy them on bad things. You say, well, I got a B on that, or I got a C or D on that test. Well, you know, who, it's not gonna matter in five years. But it does matter now, um, and that's one of the reasons why you did the studying, or maybe failed to, there were other things. Um, I think that, so as, a, as, as to your question, is this an updating of Stoicism? I think that this problem and the, the way that the Stoics so this is just a question about the, an answer just about how the ancient Stoics handled this problem. Some ancient Stoics went full bore and said, yep, you gotta say no to even the good stuff in your life. And so um, there was a, a, a handful, there were a handful of Stoics that were willing, Panatius was one who was willing to say, you shouldn't even have a preference as to whether or not you're uh, ill or healthy. Uh, whether or not you're uh, uh, rich or poor, don't, don't even bother having preferences with regards to these things. Um, and then there were other Stoics who said, well, there's a difference between saying that something truly matters morally and then you having preferences and that you can enjoy the things that are preferable when you have them. And that's in fact what we've got here. And so Marcus is somebody who actually does his best to try this. So Marcus has what he calls the doctrine of joy, that you're supposed to be able to see the beauty in things whenever you see it, whenever you are able to, to sort of see things aright. Now the funny thing is, is that that seems to run in contrast with the way that the table exercise went. Was like, well, you know, the things that you really want, you're supposed to see them like they're gross and ugly. But all the other stuff that you don't want, maybe see the, try to see the beauty in it. Um, so it does, I mean, I think that there's a very deep tension there. I think that uh, you put your finger on it. Um, sometimes integrating these two perspectives, and I think that this is a sort of a problem that we always have integrating the perspective of, of, of us taking a view on ourselves with our own self-interested perspective is one that is a sort of a regular problem uh, for us. And I think that the Stoics just relive a version of this. Okay, well actually that's very helpful. That, will, that opens up my second question and then we'll uh, turn this over to the, uh, the rest of you. One way of thinking about ethics would be to try and come up with a set of consistent principles which once you sort of figure them out you can apply them to your uh, your life and the kind of situations that you find, and things will then go smoothly once you've figured all the principles out. But another way of thinking about ethics is that what ethics does is not give you a set of consistent principles at all. What it gives you is a bunch of considerations that you genuinely should try and apply to every situation, but there's no guarantee at all. In fact, almost very rarely does this happen that you'll 
come up with an answer that's completely satisfying. In other words, ethics is a, is a kind of site of struggle between competing uh, values and demands and duties and so on. I mean, how often do you think, well, what should I do? And you're drawn this way and you're drawn that way. And it's not, a, it's not because you're, you're being selfish on the one hand and you're being honorable on the other. You're trying to do the honorable thing, but there are lots of competing ways of doing the right thing. What if ethics was like that? That is, that it's not um, just about finding you know, the right principle. It's about being able to deal with the impossible complexity and contradictoriness of life. Would the Stoics help us if you held that view? Um, well, I think that, so on the one hand, Stoic ethics has got really two faces. One is this kind of code of conduct uh, line where they articulated a number of principles like the don't cheat principle and things like that. And um, on the other hand, you have Stoic ethics also being committed to how, in, how you can live a good life and how you can flourish and live well. And they thought that, they thought that you needed to integrate the two. The trouble is that I think that you're, the trouble that you're pointing out is that it looks like really hard ethical problems are problems that codes of conduct complicate instead of, instead of clarify. Is that right? No, they might, they might help you get to the point of realizing what a mess you're in. <laughs> uh, I mean, in other words, supposing you, you had to be truthful <laughs> as well as being fair. Yeah. And you can imagine a situation in which, okay. you know, telling the truth is actually going to cause somebody an awful lot of pain That's right. or be unfair or whatever. Right. Which, what do you do? Well, so again, I think that, so the Stoics were very interested in uh, these sort of ethical puzzles uh, that, that, again, and, and ones that we are familiar with today, like the status of the white lie, right? So they had, the Stoics had a sort of a don't, a don't lie policy and they had a do no harm policy. And the problem is that sometimes telling the truth does harm. And so the Stoics scratched their head and said, try not to get into yourself into those situations. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think, that, I think that, that, that once we start trying to codify co codes of conduct, we're going to be able to start finding places where the messiness of life starts coming in. This is the reason why the Stoics did their best to recognize that those to recognize, especially in others, that they're doing their best too, that they have, that they're doing their best by their own lights, that they're being motivated by what they see as, that, as the right principle. And so even in cases where you think that you've been on the wrong side of a judgment, where it's, you think that something unjust has happened to you, the Stoics really thought, I mean, this is a, again, another paradox, is that the only thing that can actually motivate, uh, motivate anybody is that they think that they're doing something good. You can't be motivated by you saying something like, this is a bad thing, this is, I'm gonna do the worst thing that I can do. Uh, nobody actually is actually motivated by that. They can say something like, I'm gonna do something bad to somebody, but because of the fact that it's a good thing to do something bad to somebody. They deserve my revenge. They deserve my revenge, yeah. right, that's exactly it. That, that might be the reason why they do it, but the Stoics never thought that anyone does anything because they think that, it, they say, it's unjust for me to do this, so I'll do it. Nobody is actually ever motivated by that. Well, we could go on, as you can tell, um, this sort of thing we do in Furman Hall for hours at a time, but, um, We'd like to give the last uh, 10 minutes or so to, to you. Yes, up there. Mm -hmm. um, can we give you a microphone? Yeah, can we? Yeah, thank you, David. I, I think uh, we'll help other people. Is this working? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, and I find the idea of detachment interesting and one that you find in a bunch of different schools of thought. Absolutely. Uh, I, my question about it really is about whether or not it's propounded as a kind of uh, recommendation for how to live a, a life that may be ethical but also uh, where you feel less pain because you've steeled yourself. So uh, it's a kind of virtue by virtue of being something pragmatically useful to you uh, or as something that's a virtue as something that is good like a moral good and in the first case I think sure I think it's true like if I, if I want to lose weight I always think what do I care if I eat a salad or a hamburger you know half an hour <laughs> I'm not gonna be hungry I don't care so it helps right and uh, it's the spirit of the jugs <laughs> right that's right yeah. um, but, uh, but if it's propounded as a general moral good, 
I think it's a problem because I think the notion of generality when it comes to psychological coping devices is very poor because there are uh, differences among people, both in their inborn capacities for resilience and stoicism, and in their life experiences of such things as trauma uh, that will break anybody. You know, go to a concentration camp and right. the people, Good. virtuous people, will be doing despicable things. Uh, and I've never had to face it. So that, you know, if it's looked at as a moral code of conduct, I'm yeah. against it. So thank you. <laughs> and I really like this distinction about what you might call a, a philosophical view that adds to what you might call the inward livability of your life, and then a philosophical view that, that one, that's one that you can sort of recommend to anybody in, in, in any situation. Now, the funny thing, uh, so I, I, it, it definitely seems, it seems like it would be so inappropriate to say to somebody in the midst of suffering, here, I've got a copy of Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. In the midst of this suffering, you should read this, right? Uh, it seems like it's too late once you've gotten to this point. It seems like it would be like, you should be stoic instead of crying about this. Uh, that seems inappropriate to do that. And in fact, by the way, uh, the Stoics recognize this too. So Epictetus said, when your friend has lost a family member and he's weeping and, and, uh, and, and, and grieving, you should grieve with him too. You should grieve with him too. Just don't grieve inside. Right, so it's not that you're not. It's not that the stoic goes out and wags his finger at somebody and says, "Don't you see how the world is crushing you?" You know, you're supposed to have a kind of sympathy with them. Um, but I, I really like the observation that you made about the way that it re, that the stoic invulnerability looks like, especially if you look at like cases of um, like the. Are you familiar with the Milgram experiment, where they where you're able where they were able to uh, induce pretty much anybody to uh, deliver electric shocks, or they, were, they weren't actually delivering electric shocks, that under certain kinds of situations of duress, it turns out that like we're really pliable, that we don't have the kind of control that we think that we do. And it looks like we've got a lot more fragile minds than the Stoics think that we might. And so there might be no inner citadel, and that would be bad news for Stoicism. Thank you. One of the bullet points was the word justice, which was not greatly elaborated on, and the other word that just came up at the end of your conversation with each other was revenge. And um, this has to do with when, and from a broader perspective than the Stoics, include them, yeah. when is personal revenge as opposed to state-imposed revenge? Is there a place for personal revenge? Yeah, is there a place for personal revenge? So I think that the Stoic and Socratic answer is is a re, is uh, is a resolute no. I think that uh, this that especially from uh, from the perspective of uh, again, whenever we were talking at the end, it was about trying to articulate why somebody would do something wrong, and from the Stoic perspective. Uh, it, the answer is going to be the only reason why people did something that you think is wrong is because of the fact that they thought it was right. Now, they might have been wrong that it was correct, but, and maybe they should have known better. And so the thing that people deserve if they've done wrong is not revenge, but education. Uh, that they need some sort of remediation on what's good. Um, but that said, you know, uh, it, does seem, it does seem like it's an incredibly pacifistic view. And in fact, that's one of the upshots of, of Stoicism is a kind of pacifism. The great irony is that Marcus Aurelius wrote at least the first half of the meditations while he was uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the River Gran uh, in uh, campaigns against the Quadi, uh, a sort of a, a, group, a, 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 tr a group of tribes up on the Danube. So Marcus Aurelius ironically wrote a pacifist book while at war. Uh, you had said that the, n nothing is permanent, yeah. and uh, I think the Vedas may have been the first to say that there's no yeah. duality, Excellent. nothing's permanent, there is no, no, no thing is what we should be worshiping, or is the ultimate thing, it's, and I, I'm not really speaking this absolutely clearly, but even in the religions that tend towards that, they still will say the compassion and good are the goals, and I'm not convinced that that's right. Mm. You know, I mean, you, you talk yeah. about it like being true, that, that we're driven, but 
misses something. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, this is an interesting observation that you made, uh, especially at the beginning, which is that there are a lot of traditions, um, and I just talked about the, this sort of paradoxical tradition in Greece, but versions of tr this tradition seem to have been popping up in, around in the ancient world all over. And so there are a lot of parallels thought-wise uh, between Buddhism and Stoicism, that there's a deep, deep connection between the two of them. And in fact, a lot of folks have been trying to figure out whether or not there was a kind of intellectual exchange between East and West when Alexander went, uh, made it all the way over, over to the River Ganges, that a lot of philosophers, Alexander sort of thought of himself as a philosopher and a lot of philosophers went along with him. And they talked to the folks that they called the gymnosophists, the naked wise men. So, and then they came back to Greece and started talking like Stoics. And so there was a question as to whether or not Stoicism is another, is another form of that. So that's a very, that's a really good observation. Um, there is a question, and this is sometimes, so actually I've got a, in my book on Epictetus, uh, I've got exactly a version of your question. Uh, I call this the integration problem, and which is that if it doesn't matter from the perspective of eternity if you've received harm, right? If you say it's, it doesn't matter from the perspective of eternity if I've been unjustly treated, does it matter from the perspective of eternity if I unjustly treat another? Right? If, that, if, if, if it works that way, then it should work this other way too. And that's a real, pro I think that that would be a real problem for Stoicism because the Stoics really were about doing your duty. The whole reason why you want to have this inner peace is so that you can be a better human being. But if all the means that allow you to achieve this inner peace can also be put in the service of making you a terrible human being, we've got a problem. Okay, I think we have just room for one quick question and quick answer, and then we'll call it a day. To spring off that a bit, are, are there universal truths? Uh, justice in North Korea may be different than justice in Norway. Are there only really individual truths and individual rules we find for ourselves and then we have a social contract by which we construct universal truths by which we live? Um, man, um, so, Got, uh, so got, let me got, uh, let got me got a minute. Uh, yeah, I've got a minute. Excellent. Yeah, I think that that's how Plato answered. Uh, he, I think that that was the minute, uh, the minute project of answering deep questions. So I think even they didn't even give TED talkers ten, fifteen minutes, right? Um, so here here's the short version of the answer. I'm inclined to say that if we have somebody who says all requirements of justice are relative uh, and they're really context dependent. And my thought is that if, I, if we were to crack them in the head with a shovel any time that they said that, they would say, hey, that wasn't fair, you don't get to do that. We'd say, well, it's, we, that's how we do it here. Um, I'm inclined to say that they would probably change their tune and say, well, maybe it's the, if you, you get, you, you, one requirement of justice is the, this minimal one, that people get to say there's peace or something like that. So there's a kind of, like, so again, that's, that's a weird strategy to say something like, well, it's not like I'm threatening you, but it's like if I threatened you, that would be wrong, right? Um, and I think some version of that thought, this kind of non-coercion commitment uh, behind intellectual discussion, behind all, all of these sorts of things, are kind of deep thoughts that like, even if you are questioning whether or not there were universal and deep abiding principles, it looks like you're still, if you're posing it as a question, you're asking, hey, let's play by the rules here and you need to answer me instead of threaten me or something like that. So I'm inclined to say that some, some version of an answer like that shows that, that there is some kind of deep rule that we all kind of rely on and abide by. Thank you. I think you. it's time we thank our speaker and thank you. Come back, come back on March the 6th for David Padgett talking about global climate change, even here in Nashville. Thank you.